Hello, everybody. Very happy to welcome you back to the latest of the Utopias podcast. And uh, today, really excited to bring on an icon, a feminist, a punk rocker, a hilarious character whose path has crossed many interesting characters in the underground and the zeitgeist of punk and music and feminist and zine culture. I'm speaking here about Kathleen Hanna, uh, one of the front uh, women of the great band Bikini Kill, the electronic band La Tigra, and uh, the Julie Ruin. So Kathleen is really, really amazing. A lot of fun, a breath of fresh air to talk to, as you'll all hear. And we hear a lot about amazing stories from um, iconic folks that some of us might remember or think about or hear about, like Nirvana, Kurt Cobain, Ad Rock, her husband, who's one of the three Beastie Boys and one of the two living Beastie Boys, how she met her husband. Um, but more than anything, we hear the story of someone who wants the world to be more humane, wants the world to be more equal, and tries to go about it in a do-it-yourself or DIY way. So you hear a lot about DIY culture in this conversation that we have today um, and about everything from creating your own zine, you know, kind of like the way people create blogs and try to bring people to them for independent voices and a challenging misogyny on all levels, uh, but also doing so with a bit of like that punk spirit, you know, making things fun, making things funny, making things defiant. And um, that's a lot of what you hear, the flavor of this conversation that I have with the wonderful Kathleen Hanna. And um, this is also to celebrate her recent memoir, which came out, which is called Rebel Girl. It was just released May 14th. And uh, we, in this, in this uh, memoir, we learn a lot about her childhood, about Nirvana, about meeting her husband. And, um, and in our conversation, we talk a lot about community how media and technology of all kinds can support true community, in this case, uh, the, the, the technology or media form of a zine. And we learn a great deal about uh, the 80s, the 90s, and where we're at today, the legacies of great music culture, great art culture, great feminist culture. Um, again, core to the mission of the Utopias podcast, this is a conversation not about separation or fragmentation, but about uh, supporting um, a deeper vision of our interconnectedness. And so that can't be achieved until all voices are lifted. And Kathleen's is just certainly amazing, as you'll hear about. Um, thank you for joining us. And I hope you enjoy this interview and enjoy all our Utopias episodes. They're available on all streaming platforms. Please uh, give us a five-star review if you are able. Share this with others. This is a labor of love. And this is all about the Utopias podcast, as you know, um, telling stories of those who care and repair in many different ways, in many different walks of life. Enjoy. Okay, so this is a big, big uh, honor and joy for me to be in conversation with Kathleen Hanna. Kathleen is someone I've I've sort of looked up to and admired and and known of, you know, back dating back to when I was like 17, 18 years old. So, you know, just last year, just kidding. Um, and Kathleen has just is is um I'll give I'll give your full bio, you know, in of more formally later, but it's um but Kathleen is founding member of a incredible band Bikini Kill, I would say iconic pioneering Riot Girl band. Um, and I was super into Riot Girl through my friend Wendy, through our mutual friend when I was in college, and also um, a, a founding member of La Tigra, which uh, had the iconic record, Get Off the Internet, which I think is interesting to consider right now. But I'm also here to talk with Kathleen today about this awesome book, which I have right in front of me. Look at that great cover. Oh, that's what's up. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rebel Girl, My Life as a Feminist Punk. So Kathleen, thank you for joining us. It means a lot to me and welcome to the Utopias podcast. Thanks for having me. We had such a good conversation at that party and now we just get to keep going. Because I remember being like, I want to keep talking. Me too. <laughs> me too. And I was like, Wendy is so, so I want to start actually with that. So, you know, I met you at, at our mutual friend Wendy Yao's party. Uh, it, was for, it was a birthday for her son. And I was talking with you uh, without knowing who you were. I was talking with you about, you know, um, the work I, I've been doing for years, looking at 
technology's relationship to political activism, to mobilization, and how this digital takeover of everything and anything might support, you know, the val values of economic justice, of feminism, of 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 social justice, of of a sort of a planet that's more humane, more compassionate, more democratic. And you mentioned to me, hey, this that that's cool. Like that's the kind of thing I used to be engaged with, but not really much involving the internet and digital technology. But I used to, you know, write these uh, these feminist zines and and build community through the collaborative process of writing and 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 community. So I want to just start right there. So like, t tell me a little bit about like your own personal story growing up and 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 zines in particular. Like, what what are zines? Are they around today? What did they signify? And why are they important to like look at even today? Zines are around long before. I was born. I mean, there were like zines like fueling the Russian Revolution. There are zines and, you know, all, every kind of radical thing that has happened. Um, there's been self-published, you know, little booklets that people hand out to try and get their ideas across because the mainstream media either won't cover them or are basically in, in opposition, total opposition to what they're doing. And they ended up being called zines because in the 70s when punk was starting and I this is my knowledge, not like probably I, I haven't read books about it. This is just like what I've gathered over the years is that um, people started making these self-published little Xeroxed um, booklets or pamphlets and they would do them to interview punk bands who weren't being interviewed by the mainstream media um, in the UK uh, in the seventies. And so they would call them fanzines because they were fans of these bands. So they were typically around bands. Um, but a lot of fanzines have nothing to do with bands. Um, you know, they can be about any issue that somebody feels engaged with or is excited about. They can sometimes be all visual. They can be all drawings, um, what have you. But I got interested in them. I mean, I actually made them started making one by accident because I was writing all this weird stuff that didn't really go with any of my college courses. I went to school at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, um, which is like a pretty cheap state school, but it was like alternative in that it didn't it's have grades. It's a great grades. school, actually. There's law. Really? Not that much? Well, <laughs> we can, we can <laughs> argue that later, but it was, it was great in that everyone I knew who went there kept learning after they left. Like, there was a lot of problems with that school. It has like this kind of like radical veneer, but um, being a young feminist who went there, I was not supported by the faculty. Um, and there was a, a lot of um, racism and sexism and homophobia happening on campus that if you talked about it, at least in the 90s, um, it was like, what are you talking about? We're so progressive. You know, like when liberalism really does you wrong. Um, but yeah, I started making zines because I was going to go to this workshop by the writer Kathy Acker and I had to have put some work together and I uh, just, you know, took a bunch of my photography because I was a photography student and I mixed it with all of this writing I was doing and put it into like a little, we call them chat books, um, a self-published little thing of writing to bring with me to give to Kathy. And I called it Fuck Be Blind and um, I didn't really even know what it, I think I called them Zines. I didn't know what they were, how to pronounce them correctly. And uh, yeah, and then later I got very influenced by Toby Vale, who's my bandmate in Bikini Kill, the drummer and um, sometimes singer. And she wrote a fanzine called Jigsaw. And it was the first time that I heard, I, I read anything that was about feminism and punk in the same place. Like I was like, what? You know, like, because I was, you know, really interested in music and stuff, but I couldn't really find my place. And I was like, this is my place. And I found it in not a real location. I found it in paper. I found it in, which I think is really similar to stuff happening on the internet is that these are not real locations. Like these are not brick and mortar buildings, but they psychologically function as brick and mortar buildings. Like a lot of these zines made me feel transported to a place where I was welcomed and where I could share my ideas. And so I'm very interested in that idea of, of creating 
not physical locations, but almost imaginary locations that we find very fulfilling. Yeah. So in a sense, it's almost like a zine is like a space or a place for community. Yeah. Right. And I, I remember I remember reading Toby Vale's zine myself, even though I was never like a big zine head. But as I got into punk, I was reading Comet Bus and literally going to like record stores and buying vinyl so I could like and, and then anytime I'd buy vinyl, I try to pick up a couple of zines um, and, and punk and zine culture have have had a strong kinship throughout history. You know, not all of our listeners are punks or maybe even know what punk is. I mean, I know punk has changed, of course, but can, can you help us like wrap our heads around? Because I think punk is an animating spirit. It's community. It's solidarity. But but help us like kind of like understand or make meaning about the beautiful and powerful energy that is punk culture and punk music. Uh, you know, it's so hard to define stuff because it's like, you know, I am not Miriam Webster, but um, <laughs> I, I don't I, I thank thank God, you know, but um, at the at, actually girl G.R.R.L. is in the dictionary now, which is pretty strange. But um. So to me, to some people, punk is a genre of music that is loud and brash and in your face and this, you know, it's kind of a style, an aggressive style of music that doesn't um, follow the pop structure necessarily. Although most early punk really does follow pop structure, but I don't subscribe to that definition of it. I, be I believe that punk is more than a genre. I believe it's an idea and I believe you find punks in every location, you know, Punk to me is about saying, you know, the rich and the wealthy don't get to create art for us and tell us what is good art or good music or good writing. We can create it ourselves in our own communities. Um, and we don't need the stamp of approval from Geffen or a book company or, you know, what have you. Like we can make things from our own sites of resistance that we're creating. And that was a really, I lived in Olympia, Washington, um, for my college from 17 to, I mean, off and on till I was like 27 maybe. And I stayed there for so long because there was a real supportive community where like people would be like, oh, you want to play guitar? Come over. I'll show you how. You want to, you know, learn how to make a zine? Come over to my house. I've got a stapler. Um, all of our zines were made on stolen copy cards from Kinko's or because we knew someone who worked at Kinko's. And we would go there in the middle of the night and they would just be like, you know, here's the thing, just go do all the copies you want. And so it was always this um, thing where people were encouraging each other to make stuff. And we really saw ourselves as like contributing to culture and that we're like, we're not going to just listen to Guns N' Roses and say that's what rock and roll is. Or, you know, even the Sex Pistols, there's a certain style of music. It's, you know a bunch of white guys with a typical rock setup and it actually is a very pop structure. Although I love a lot of songs by the Sex Pistols and I love um, what they did for me as a person and, and um, what they contributed to culture. But the kind of punk that I found in Olympia was more about, you don't have to be a super trained musician. You can just get up on stage and try. And sometimes these beautiful things happen when you make mistakes and then you compound those mistakes and then they become songs and they become albums and they become, you know, whatever. And it was much less based on toxic masculinity and more based on community and welcoming. Because, you know, I went to punk shows in high school and I stopped going because I was getting spit on. And I was like, me and my two girlfriends who were the only girls who were there, you know, we make it to the front and then the lead singer spits on us because it's punk. Like it had become this thing that was like a jacket you wear, you know, which happens to all kind of scenes and movements and stuff. They get co-opted. Um, but to me, it was never about, you know, wearing a black leather jacket. And there's a lot of things about early punk that are despicable. There's a lot of like Nazi paraphernalia that people were wearing. There's a lot of racism. There's a lot of sexism, a lot of homophobia. And there was also places like in LA where punk took hold, where it was like a lot of BIPOC people, a lot of... Um, gayness going around, a lot of stuff that has been swept under the rug in terms of the history, the official history of punk. So there's always been sites of punk that are really fascinating and and feel very, very relevant. 
Um, and then there's always been places where, you know, people are just like, I'm wearing my punk outfit and I'm yelling at you because I'm mad, you know? Um, but I, I really think that, that punk is about community and about sites of resistance. Yeah. Community resistance, do it yourself, right? It's a term we hear not just in relation to punk, but I first learned it in relation to punk DIY, right? That any of us, no matter who or where we are, whether we're female or male, whether we're queer, whether we're trans, whether we're of different colors, different races, who the heck cares? We will all do it ourselves. And what we will do is create energy and community and and just thrash around if we if we want to or need to. And there's something really powerful and embodied about that spirit, about being in a DIY show. Um which had, you know, for me, had was a huge, huge influence on me. If if I didn't find punk myself, Kathleen, I would not at all be the person I I am. It it was the basis of my for me being an activist on many levels. It opened my world up, and for the first time in my own life, it was the first community I was ever in. Um, I was sort of a lost Indian American, overachieving kid, child of immigrants, probably would have gone the corporate route otherwise, but I was never going to do that because I was a punk through and through. You know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, That's great. And you know, this, I, 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 I want to talk to you about, you know, this, this important point, which is like feminism as expressed through punk. And we know there's different waves of feminism and ver sometimes there are different types of feminism that contrast with one another. But I think this is really, really important and, and, and really kind of taking us to where Riot Girl comes out of, right? Lady Fest. To tell sharing with us stories about Toby Vale. You know, I know you all were connected to, you know, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana and other, I mean, there were a lot of other great bands, maybe the Wipers and other bands like that. I love the Wipers. I, know. Um, I love the Wipers. Um, but also, <laughs> you know, Riot Girl, I, I see, and I'm curious how you think of it, is, was direct, is like directly connected to all this amazing kind of female punk, like that was earlier, like the Slits, and X-ray specs and Susie and the Banshees. I know I'm like just like geeking out on it. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Like where, you know, the Riot Girl movement coming out of Olympia and Lady Fest and how it was connected to either like really famous stuff at the time, like Nirvana, but also I would say just forever timeless music, like the music of the raincoats or the slits or, you know, all of them, you know, Delta five, it just, it just keeps going on and, or Lydia lunch. It just keeps going on and on, you know? You know, it's like when you mentioned all these great bands, I'm like, Oh gosh, yes. I've totally been influenced by <laughs> Lydia lunch. I mean, life changing. Um, I was just like, I can't even believe that she exists, you know, and what a trail trailblazer. Um, I remember a cleaning that for some reason I got this, image of, I, I used to, in the summer times, we would get a job um, cleaning the dorms. We didn't even live in the dorms, but I would clean the dorms. And I remember cleaning the dorms, like the toilets at the dorms, because um, you'd make a bunch of money. They'd give you like $500 or something for like a week. And we were cleaning the, uh, me and my, my best friend Allie were cleaning the toilets and we were listening to Lydia Lunch really loud on a cassette player. And I was just, it, it's this moment I'll never forget because it like made this hideous job totally fine. I was like, I don't care if I'm cleaning toilets right now. I was like, because this is like something I've never heard. But um, the stuff that, you know, really influenced me back then was Northwest stuff. I mean, we were very, very local and we didn't have the internet. So I didn't know at first. Toby turned me on to the slits um, maybe a year into the band. Um, I was very much listening to Rites of Spring um, to Babes in Toyland, to uh, local band or bands that Sub Pop was putting out singles of, like L7. Um, oh yeah, I remember L7. They even had a couple mainstream hits. I remember. Yeah, and they did. They did. Uh, there was this like singles club, and it was like STP, and um, I don't know if Seven Year Bitch had one, but it was mostly like local, local northwest northwest stuff that was really influencing us and. I was booking um, shows for an art gallery, a collective art gallery that me and my girlfriends ran. And so I was booking bands like Scrawl from Ohio, um, Mecha Normal, who did this thing called the Black Wedge Tour, and it was poets and activists and musicians. And they came down and just showed me the way. I was like, oh, wow, 
I don't have, if I'm going to be in a band and stuff, like I don't have to give up my politics to do it. You know, like Gene and, and, um, I'm now I'm like blanket, David Lester, Gene, Gene Smith and David Lester, they put together this whole thing where they're, you know, they're speaking out against war. They're talking about environmentalism. They're talking about feminism. They're talking about racism. And it's like, they're doing it in this package of like, also that's very entertaining. And I was like, oh, you know, they came to our gallery and we sat on the floor and watched them and we're just like, you know, I want to interview you for my fanzine. So I brought them to my house. I took pictures of them. I interviewed them for my fanzine. And that's how you kind of start a scene. And they lived in Canada, but we were forever connected to them from that moment on because, you know, I Bikini Kill put them in our zine and then we would, you know, visit on the road or, see, you know, go see them play. And it was just, it was really Olympia and really the Northwest, the band, the obituaries. Um, Monica Shank was the singer in, in uh, Oregon and she was a fantastic singer. I mean, a real belter, like, like Beth Ditto from the gossip, like had a voice like that. Um, and I was so in awe of these women and so looked up to them and really wanted to be like them. And then Toby, who was, you know, my friend, but I also like looked up to her and she was a mentor. She'd been in bands like the go team, um, and stuff before. And so I was like, oh, she knows what she's doing. You know, she's been a drummer for a long time. She sings. Um, so it was really more local stuff that was influencing me back then. And then, um, reading, you know, June Jordan, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks was huge in the nineties. Um, Paulo Freire. The sweetest, the sweetest Bell Hooks. So oh, we miss her. Yeah. It was, you know, we were, we were, I was in college. Toby was like, worked at the sandwich shop and was a local. Um, and she didn't go to college at the time. And, but we were reading books and like giving, you know, Hey, read this, Hey, read that. And, you know, we were talking, discussing all of these books together. And then our songs were coming out of what we read. And I have to credit Bell Hooks, like, and to a huge amount for like being someone who was taking these really academic, you know, intellectual thoughts and making them readable for regular everyday people um, and for and also thrilling for academics, both. And I was like, that's a magic trick that can't be replicated. Like I was so in awe of her writing ability and, and her style and the way that she presented theory using examples that people could really easily grasp onto. And I was like, I want to do that with music. I want to take this feminist theory, and a lot of it was like French feminist theory at the time, and I want to put that in action in punk songs and bring it to the stage. And I also, I worked at a local domestic violence rape relief shelter, and I was seeing the shelter fill up over and over. And yet all the guys that I knew in the punk scene were like, why are you talking about feminism? It's over. Women are equal now, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, then why is the phone ringing off the hook? At the shelter, why am I intaking new women every night? Why are there never enough beds? If sexism's over, that wouldn't be the case. And so I also wanted to bring that experience into music because I saw how rape and domestic violence and, you know, living in an incest household was affecting everyone around me. You know, you go to college and first year, I saw so many young women dropping out because they were finally away from their families and remembering things that had happened in their families and feeling overwhelmed and going to counselors who didn't know how to deal with them. And so this keeps women from getting educated. This is something that, you know, then they ha they're having a mental health crisis and have no money and have no help. And they drop out of college and get a job at, you know, Denny's. And that's it. You know, not that's it. They can go on to lead wonderful, interesting lives as well. But it's like, it really pained me to see people who lost the chance at an education because of violence that had been done to them at a young age that they were remembering and not getting help for. And I wanted to be a part of some kind of solution, you know, to that. And then lyrics, I was like, hey, you know, I'm standing here watching all these guys sing about how much they hate their girlfriends. Like, what if I sing about what my life is about? What if I sing about you know, domestic violence and being harassed on the street and, you know, being treated as less than in my classes. Um, and, and what if I take some of this theory that I'm reading and I turn it into a song? 
it's really powerful right because it's it's through the through the song through the music through the energy of the of of it it not just calls attention to the incredible ongoing by the way decades later discrimination discrimination which we can see in many different facets of american and global society of how women are continue to be treated very subserviently to men including in the us where you look at pay equity wage equity many other issues right but it's it's powerful to it's almost you're using the modality of punk and the diy culture to call attention to these issues that are really tied to you personally too and i i i think that's amazing i mean bell hooks is one of the biggest inspirations around why this podcast even exists, honestly. Um, so I really appreciate that. So, so if we if we're to if we're to talk now about Riot Girl in particular, um, what would you say are sort of some of the main like tenets or principles or values of Riot Girl feminism? So we can understand that a little, and then I want to ask you about the book. You know, it's really hard to define Riot Girl because if you read the book, it's like I actually spell out like I wasn't that involved. You know, a lot of times, you know. I was kind of the cute white girl that made good copy, you know, so I became the leader because I was photogenic at the time and I was in a band and, you know, I was singing the songs and, uh, and I did with me and my friend, Allison Wolf from Bratmobile did call the first meeting, but it initially, it was initially meant to be a fact finding mission. Very selfishly. I wanted to start a music magazine about women in music. And I wanted to see, we had just gotten to DC and I wanted to see um, if other women were interested. Um, And it turned out they weren't. (laughs) It turned out that a a lot of the women in the group were just like needed to talk and be heard and be seen and see each other. We started these meetings in DC um, and I was like I said, going to find out if people wanted to work on this magazine with me and no one did. And then it turned into kind of like a consciousness raising, skill sharing thing. And there was a lot of young women who were in the hardcore scene specifically in DC and they were being pushed to the back at every show. We're being told that, you know, they couldn't be musicians, uh, don't even try this kind of thing. And so people were like, oh, do you want to play music with me? Or do you want to start a zine? Or you know, let's put on a show of this band that we want to get to town and um, sort of just encourage participation, you know, like active participation. And like, we're going to come in and like, you know, we love the punk scene. There's problems with it. But instead of destroying it, we're going to become more a part of it and we're going to change it so that we can we can fit with it and be a part of it. And um, and we're going to challenge, you know, the whole thing about punk is like challenging the status quo and much many tenants of of punk had become very stale and very status quo. And so we were like, everyone's going to be so happy because here we are, you know, being punk and challenging the status quo. But that wasn't really what happened. People, a lot of boys especially, and some women were very angry at what we did. And we had female-only meetings. And that was, you know, I think I would definitely be trans-inclusive if I was having meetings today. Um, That wasn't something that was really on the radar in DC in 1991 or 92 when it started. But then it just sort of kept going. And I I went in and out because I was on tour all the time. And it became this phenomenon that was, you know, there were riot girl groups in Malaysia. There were riot girl groups all over Europe. There were riot girl groups in Latin America, um, all over the US, all over Canada. It really kind of became this thing where people could just make it their own, you know. And, and what I saw was mostly what was going on in the U.S. And I didn't, we, again, we didn't have internet. So I would find out what was going on in Riot Girl Minneapolis when my band played and I hung out with some Riot Girls afterwards. That's actually how I met Wendy. She invited me, our, our friend Wendy Yao, who was in the band Emily Sassy Lime, uh, invited me to a Riot Girl meeting in L.A. that I think she was one of the founders of. And she was 15. And, uh, yeah, and we ended up just going to a Denny's and, and talking. Um, but yeah, I've been friends with her ever since. And like, she was 15 then. So I don't know how old I was like 25. I mean, I remember and, um, shout out to Wendy. Yeah. You know, so everybody like, um, check out Emily Sassy Lime. I have a couple, I think they have two records out, two EPs or something like that. I have both records right behind me. 
it's 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 it sounds like it was almost like cathartic to 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 create i mean those that's my words not yours um to 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 start to play music and form this community try to push this as a movement in a way even though punk is is and was amazing in many ways it was perpetuating misogyny and sexism take me to like the forming of bikini kill and 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 like kind of how that happens I'm curious about any relationship you all may have had to Nirvana and Kurt Cobain at that time, because I know from interviews I've read, Kurt Cobain was seemed like a really amazing person and really into punk. Um, but I don't know, you know, I never met him. <laughs> but um, but it, but but really, kind of take us to the founding of Bikini Kill and some of the other bands that were like your friends at that time. Yeah, Olympia. Olympia, um, yeah, take us to Olympia. Like, help us go there. I wish I had been there. You know, you really don't. <laughs> I would have been in solidarity with it all, but like maybe I'll you, get yeah. the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You would have probably, it would have been fun for about a week and then you'd be like, ah. For a um, week. For a week. <laughs> it, 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 it could be a really amazing, wonderful, supportive place. It was also very white. It was also um, sometimes people were very like, we don't have problems in this scene because we welcome everybody. And it was sort of this like, we're humanitarians. And it's like, you know, love, see no color. Or like, you know, well, I don't care what gender you are, but then you actually do. Because if I get up on stage and I actually say something about rape, God forbid, um, you're going to be like, that's embarrassing. Why are you talking about that? Shut up, you know? So it, at the same time that it was very supportive of people making art, what kind of art? If you made certain kinds of art, it was kind of it was treated as um embarrassing a little bit. So, it wasn't always this like open arm for everybody um situation that I wish it would have been, but I think part of the thing that's so great is that so many people had been there before that even made that scene that made us feel welcome, that, uh, that let us speak out and let us go against walls. And I'm hoping that continues in the future, you know, with other people who run against the status quo that in a way Riot Girl created um, in terms of like the connections between Riot Girl and white feminism um, in a bad way and, you know, run up against that wall and then create their own thing um, that is better and uh, more intersectional than, than what we made. But I'm, I'm getting away from Olympia. So Olympia has a well in a parking lot and it's a water well a water well whoa all right and it now they have like fences and stuff around it because i just went back a few months ago but that well was like where people would go fill up water bottles before that was a thing of filling up water bottles like you would just keep your water water bottles from the store and i mean tap water was okay but this water was so delicious like more, like we would do taste tests, like Perrier versus, you know, <laughs> not like any of us bought Perrier, but a, or Evian, that's the still one. But this well, there was this whole saying, it's in the water. And it was from Olympia beer, which was our most famous export. And the myth was if you met someone, someone, a band came to town or um, someone you had a crush on came to town and you wanted them to come back, you would take them to the well and have them drink the water, and something about the water draws you back. And I swear it's totally true. Um, my current husband drank from the well. Um, and when I, I lived in a place, we were talking about squatting before we turned on, and when I lived in a place that we were basically squatting and had no water, like we would go down there and like brush our teeth in the morning and fill up our water jugs. And we would meet everybody else in the town who didn't have running water that way. Um, and a little community kind of formed around the well of like, we were the people who at seven in the morning were at the well together. Um, so that's the kind of small town vibe that it is, um, or that it was at least then. And, um, yeah, we started making music. I'd already been in a band called Viva Knievel that was sort of a heavy metal band. And, um, I was already singing about like domestic violence and stuff like that. And also just singing bratty punk stuff that, you know, think about things that piss me off. And then I met Toby and I heard that Toby thought I was a good singer. And I was like, oh my God, like I couldn't believe anybody thought I was a good singer. Um, and or, she didn't say I was a good singer. I think she said I was a good front person. 
And so I were a different kind of a, yeah. yeah, like one of those things of like fun to watch, you know, but, um, I remember her, like when my band Viva Knievel played at Rucka Muse and she was standing in the doorway and I remember seeing her silhouette and being like, I wonder if she likes it. And then years, you know, a year later or something, finding out she did. And then I thought she, she asked me to join the band, but I guess I asked her, which actually tracks, um, because she's much more introverted than I am. So I guess I said we should start a band together. And then she was working at a sandwich shop with Kathy, who was the bass player. And she just like, they never talked to each other, like barely at all. They said like five words to each other. And then one day she's just like, you want to be in my band? <laughs> and then we started, <laughs> we just started a band, like the three of us. And Toby was the only one who knew how to play anything. Um, and it just felt really liberating because you know I'd read Jigsaw and so I knew Toby was really well read Kathy was a filmmaker she was like super smart she's like talking about Chantel Ackerman and all this stuff and I was just like oh my god what um but so it was like these two fantastic intellectual young women and I was like in their midst and I just felt like you know the weird friend who was so grateful to be there um and then we started playing music and I was like I felt so different than I had in my band previously because everyone in my band previously were like musicians like they made up songs and I felt like they knew more than me and I felt like they kind of like were rolling their eyes when I sang about you know what would be considered women's issues and then in this band if I sang some you know feminist content type lyrics it was like oh, wow, that was really cool. And I was like, I can do anything, you know? <laughs> like, it just, I remember driving around in my truck. I had this jacked up white Datsun or Toyota that I bought right. from from Kathy's boyfriend and um, just listening to Bleach because Nirvana used to play at Reco Muse and they played several benefits to keep us going. Um, the The art space that me and my friends ran and Kurt was friends with my good friend Tammy Ray who's an amazing photographer. And um, I just remember when Bleach came out and being like, oh my God, I love, you know, everybody loved them. They were so great. We would see them play at the dorms, at like parties, at like wherever. And it was just a good time. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't, I wasn't like, oh, someday these guys are going to be internationally famous. Like it was just like, hey, let's go to K dorm and see Nirvana and like, I mean, these dorms were so short. I'm 5'4", and I would jump so high, I would hit my head on the ceiling. <laughs> like, it was like... They, it, Real DIY they were, space. Yeah, and like the popcorn floor. ceiling, and then you leave with a, a bestest hair, you know? Totally, totally. But, um, I'm you know... I'm 6'3", so I... I you couldn't even walk in the door. Around. You'd have to, like, sit on your knees, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. But I just... I love them as a band, you know, um... I grew up with like loud rock music, Viva Knievel, the band I was in before Bikini Kill was more like on the heavy metal tip. And so I, I loved the spirit and the energy of it. I loved Kurt's voice. I loved that we would just all sweat together. Like just all the parties I remember that they would play, it was the sweat. It was just dancing furiously and everyone's just sweating. It's like a Lenny Kravitz video. <laughs> It's like it's for so real, funny. but for real. Bloody video too. Well, you know, it's always a slow motion of people dancing and they're like covered in like, you know, spray on sweat. But it was like just yeah. kids like dripping wet with sweat. <laughs> and it was like, you know, you didn't even watch the band because you were just dancing so hard. And I don't think people think of Nirvana, Nirvana as like a dance band, but it's like when they're five feet away from you and it's that loud, you move. Like <laughs> it was, you know, I just feel really fortunate to have gotten to see them in bands like, you know, Bratmobile, who were playing locally, Heavens to Betsy, which has Corin uh, and Tracy Sawyer, and Corin later was in Slater Kinney. And I got to be at, like, the first, you know, show that Corin sang at. And wow. everybody cried. Like, she hit people so hard with her voice and with her lyrics and she was in high school, I think, or just graduated, or Tracy may have been in high school. They were young. And I was just floored. And, you know, when you're, like, 22 and someone's 18, it feels like you're, like, the elder. <laughs> you know, so they weren't that much younger than me, but I was like, oh, 
they, this is real. Like they made feminist punk real to me. Like I was like, this has legs. This isn't just us anymore. You know what I mean? Like this is now other bands are forming that have their own ideas, their own sound, their own, you know, things going on. And so I was really lucky to see so many great bands and bands from Seattle, like Seven Year Bitch that live are one of the best bands I've ever seen. Celine Vigil, the singer, would do like flips in the air, like David Lee Roth, you know? And what a privilege. My One of my favorite bands of all time was from Olympia called Witchy Poo, and it's Slim Moon who ran Kill Rock Stars with Tanubial Sampson. And he Tenubial, would do... Tanubial is like a... Is like old friend? A, is, yeah, an old friend of mine and sort of like a spirit guide for me. Tanubial is like a beautiful human being. Yeah, and p people don't give her credit. She started Kill Rock Stars. Like, yeah. Everybody, shout out to Tanubial. She's living in fairly rural Maine now and it remains like someone I, I have so much love for. I knew her well for several years. And she's a great artist. She like designed all of the early Kill Rock Stars records and just a really stellar, interesting person. There was this whole thing in Olympia called the Tenuvial Basement Scene. And it was these parties in Tenuvial's basement and people would form bands just to play there. Like for some reason, it just became the thing that you didn't play with your band at Tenuvial's basement. You would form a band with someone else. And like, I think Toby and Billy and Kurt did something and, you know, it would just be just random. And that was kind of the cool spirit of, you know, it's in the water Olympia it was um, drinking the water was really about just like trying stuff out, you know, and, and not being afraid. And for girls, that was a very radical idea because, you know, the second you stand on stage, you get criticized about everything. It's like, the way you talk, oh, I talked like a valley girl, so I must be stupid, or, you know, what you look like, you're too pretty, you're too ugly, you're too this, you're too that, um, you know, your singing voice is too nasally, it's too high, it's too girly, every single thing, like, you're not trained enough, you're too well trained. And so we were just kind of like, hey, punks just got, get up and do it, why can't we do that? Well, when we did it, it was like, go back and practice, you guys suck. But when the guys in our scene did it, it was like, yay, look at them. They're creating something brand new. Um, and I found the same thing in electronic music culture, interestingly enough, when I started Lee Tigre, because, you know, it was like their mess music is so messy and like, you know, they don't know how to use their samplers. And this was the same time when glitch culture was born. And these guys were like making whole albums out of the sound of them unplugging their sampler over and over and when they on purpose set out with very expensive equipment to make mistakes and record it, they were like praised and put on all these panels. And we were sitting in the audience being like, how come everyone's telling us that we're, our mistakes are ugly and your mistakes are important and, and smart? I mean, con constant double standards. And also, you know, to this day, like w women do the most important things that are done to keep our species alive on every <laughs> single level. I mean, let's just be honest about it. It's crazy how like women are not compensated for, you know, fairly or even for caretaking work or even, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, it remains like a huge, huge, like psychic wound, I think in our country and the, and the world and in our species, you know? Yeah. But I love, I love this, like drink the water thing because it's a reminder. It's a shout out like a, to me, about how wells in different parts of the world. So like I'm South Indian. I used to, when I was a little kid in villages in South India, we would all go to the well because the well would be where everyone would hang out. So the well was a place where we would all drink the water, as you said, but it was also the, the place for community, you know, like the place for the, what happens in that, in those, in those magical moments in punk culture and punk communities where like everybody will play with everybody. And you're not playing a show, you know, to have some stupid Ticketmaster arrangement. Oh, God, I despise <laughs> Ticketmaster still. But it's it's it, but you're doing it for one another. Like you're playing shows for your community, and you're and you're all kind of in the community. And you're all playing, and you're all watching, and you're all supporting. And it's kind of like this thing where it's like we're gonna create it all together, and it's not about you know just making a bunch of money or being some like rock star. Even though it's so surreal how Nirvana you know, you, you're just like your buddies, like became this extremely famous and to this day, legendary band. <laughs> They're selling Nirvana t-shirts at Urban Outfitters today. Yeah. 
kids are wearing it. I don't know if they ever listened to Nirvana, but that's dope, you know. Um, so, so I want to ask you then about, you know, you Bikini Kill like is to you know to this day. Sometimes you play shows. I saw. I I I know that. Like Bikini Kill's influence is massive on punk music and on 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 feminist punk music. Um, so two questions. So like one, take us to like the founding of La Tigre. Like what kind of led to that? rather than kind of continuing on with Bikini Kill or doing stuff more like that style. And second, where do you think Riot Girl? where are we at with Riot Girl like today? Like who should we pay attention to? How can we revive it? Is it about reviving it? Or like, is there a new kind of face to it, a new evolution to it? Whoa, two very different questions. You're going to have to remind me of My the second brain. one when we get there. Yeah, yeah I know I'll, your I'll weird brain. Yeah. Um, so Lee Tigre was sort of, born out of a lot of frustrations that happened from being in Bikini Kill for seven years and kind of, you know, we always had uh, fans who would stand up front and support us. And, you know, I would say girls to the front so that women and girls could come to the front and, and actually see us play and not be relegated to the back of the room holding people's coats. Um, it was really important that we create community. And so we handed out lyric sheets so that people could read the lyrics and know what we were talking about because usually we played through really crappy PAs and nobody could hear what we were saying. But a big part of it was was creating community and there was always an amazing joy in that. But the, you know, bad side was there was also a lot of violence and, you know, I can't tell you how many times I was playing and guys either threw stuff at me or tried to assault me or spit beer in my face or, um, you know, just yelled shut up when I was talking over and over. Um, and... It really takes its toll. And the, the death threats, you know, we got a lot of mail and we answered it all. And the, the death threats started to get really bad um, in person and through the mail. And it just felt unsafe. It felt really unsafe. And I, I couldn't even admit it until I was writing this book how unsafe it felt. Like I had to just sort of, I was like, why don't I want to go on tour? Why am I crying in my apartment? Why do I not want to go on tour? And it's like, because I thought someone was going to kill me. Like it was getting so bad and it was from all directions. It wasn't just men. It was the men and the, you know, I'm going to chop off your breasts and da 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 kind of stuff. And then there was women who were like, you're, you're ruining punk for everyone. You're making men think that we hate them and you're dividing the scene. And, you know, and then even from um, people in Riot Girl who I was no longer in contact with who were like boycotting us for this or that. And, you know, it was like, wow, I feel kicked out of a scene I helped create. I'm very lonely. Um, and then within my band, you know, we all had varying degrees of um, upset and sadness and fear having to do with the external world and the way that we were presented um, and, and talked about and treated um, without having even opened our mouths. A lot of times we would just show up and be treated really poorly because people were like, they're man haters and we're going to, you know, we're going to do these, you know, messed up things to them. We're going to play the mentors, find her, feel her, fuck her, forget her while they're walking in. And we're going to, you know, lift all the toilet seats in the women's bathroom, hoping women fall in and get wet when they pee. Like this is literally a thing that guys did this, to try. This sort of like backlash and hate that you've been sharing. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, 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 it's it's crushing to hear this. It's like I can't believe there was so much negativity and resentment. Though you, all it was were, beyond. Like, like I mean, beyond. I could seriously tell you stories that would like. I mean, really bad. Like really bad. And there was just no. It was so petty and so hateful and so unexpected because I was very kind of like Pollyanna optimistic. Like, like as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was like, oh. You know, like we're mixing feminism and punk, just like, you know, a lot of other artists have done in the past. And like, we're bringing it to this, you know, to the Northwest and people are going to be really excited. And they weren't, you know, and they were mad at us instead. And I was like, wait, I don't understand. Like, I thought that this is what everybody be so excited and joyful about. Um, so I was really demoralized and I really did come to punk seek and to feminism seeking family because I didn't have the best family situation growing up. And so when I was let down by my, my punk family, my feminist family, my, I guess, Riot Girl family, um, which Riot Girl is just a part of feminism. To me, it was just a young 
feminist movement in the 90s that was solidified around music. Um, and then it, it grew and took on new new dimensions later. But I was getting to the reason of starting Le Tigre was I was very demoralized. And, um, you know, we had a lot of friends who were dying from AIDS, um, suicide, and heroin. Um, Kurt being obviously one of those people, and um, but not the only one. And it was just a really hard time to be in a band. And, and also the stereotyping where it's like, okay, you have to write another feminist anthem. That's all you do. You know, I felt like I couldn't write a love song. I felt like I couldn't, and I did anyway, but I kind of took to my apartment. I was very depressed and I started writing a solo album called Julie Ruin. And I started working with samples and, um, and stuff. And that kind of led me into when I moved, finally quit Bikini Kill and I moved to New York, um, I wanted to perform that live. And so I got together with my friend who I met through a zine, um, through Snarlet and Love, Johanna Fateman. She did a zine with Miranda July and uh, who many people know is like a writer and a um, performance artist and a filmmaker. But they were best friends and they made this fan scene called Snarlet and Love. And she gave it to me at a Bikini Kill show. And I was like, this is my new best friend, whoever wrote this. And so I sought her out. And then when she moved to New York, I ended up following many, many years later when Bikini Kill broke up and we started playing music together and that became Le Tigre. And it really um, was very different from Bikini Kill, partially because, you know, I was very sad about not playing with Toby. She's an amazing drummer and someone whose presence I very much missed. Um, and so it just made sense to use a drum machine instead of a live drummer because nobody could really compare to her. Um, but also we did stuff like I stopped playing $5 shows, which doesn't make me not a punk. I was living in New York and had to pay rent. And I started to realize that DIY could be a real closed classes system because if you, how, who has the, the money and the leisure time to, do everything themselves. You know, a lot of times it was straight, white, cisgendered guys with trust funds. And so they ended up being the bulk of the scene um, in a lot of different communities. In Olympia, it was a, there was a little bit more of equality because it wasn't D.C., which was, you know, it takes a lot more money to live there in New York. Um, but I also realized how the DIY thing started interacting with my kind of female volunteerism impulse of like, you know, always taking care of everyone and helping everyone. It's like, I will build the club. I will take the tickets. I will clean the floor afterwards. I will be in the band. I will, you know, and it just started to be like, why am I doing everything? And when I moved to New York and I started to, to meet people who had publicists and tour managers, and I was like, I don't have to do it all myself. I could actually keep playing music because I couldn't, it wasn't tenable to do it all DIY and take the abuse at the same time. It was too much. I needed a buffer. And so with Le Tigre, we were like, let's, you know, bring a sound person on tour as soon as we can afford it. Let's charge more money so that we can have um, videos and costumes. Let's, let's put on a show. And a lot of things that have made me very depressed about um, what happened to Riot Girl in the U.S. and what had happened in my band sort of went to the wayside and we just started writing about how thankful we were that um, all these older feminists and anti-racist activists had left this, these books for us to read and these legacies for us to learn more. And how do we write songs that say thanks? So we wrote a song called Hot Topic or a bunch of different songs on that record were inspired by different artists that we love and activists that we love and people who we were questioning. And that just became really joyous and interesting in itself. And we were really challenging punk because we were like, NSYNC has, like the band NSYNC was big at the time. And, and we were like, they've got, you know, costumes and video and backing tracks. And we're like, what if we did that, but at punk clubs? And I'd already been very involved as just a woman who took to the stage without knowing what I was doing with questioning the idea of what's authentic and what's not authentic. Um, and so I started to want to do that in a very, uh, front facing way, which was like, you know, when you, you're in a band that has dance, you know, choreography and 
um, and imagery and no live drummer, a lot of people are like, you're not in a real band. And I was like, yeah, so? Is it fun? Do you enjoy it? Do you like it? And it was typically people were like, yes, I do. And it's like, so who cares what it's called or, you know, what the genre is? You know, it, La Tigre totally rocks and 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 bounces and is super dancey. And actually, my friend Ben, I know, designed some of the clothes that you all. Oh yeah. Us. And he shout out to Ben as well, who lives here in L.A. Um, you know, I I want to I want to. It's it's really amazing to hear these stories. And and I remember when I when I met you um, at our friend Wendy's place again. I was talking about how I was writing amongst other things you know, oligarchy in tech. And you were like, and we, and I mentioned Jeff Bezos and you were like, believe it or not, I'm actually been invited to Jeff Bezos's house. I was like, can I come with you? <laughs> and you were, and you were like, well, actually my husband technically was the person invited to Jeff Bezos's house, but believe it or not, my husband's actually cool. I was like, who is this person? <laughs> and who's this cool husband? And how many cool people are actually invited to Jeff Bezos' house, who I personally don't think is that cool, just being honest. Um, so there- I didn't go. I went to see feminist comedy that night instead. Oh, that's cool. You didn't even go. You could have take you gotta take me for undercover recon next time, huh? <laughs> Remind- think of think of your old buddy. <laughs> but but I guess I want this is just to ask about, you know, you of course uh, are married to uh, Ad Rock, you know, Adam Horowitz who is also a huge influence on me and many, you know, millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands of other people just like you. And, and you are right. You have an extremely cool husband from the little I know. I've never met him. Um, tell me a little bit about that because, you know, there's a cool, there's a cool passage excerpt in your book about it. Um, I'll read it afterward um, that I, that I want to read out loud about like meeting, meeting Adam uh, and while you were like borrowing skateboards from good guys and rancid <laughs> Um, so just tell me a little bit about like how you met him and like, what's life like for the two of you today? Are you both like doing kind of creative, artistic punk rock types of things? Cause of course, Ad, Ad Rock, one of the three Beastie Boys, you know, they were first a punk band and then they became, you know, legendary hip hop figures and more. Yeah. First people to be sued for samples. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really know his music. You know, I knew I I didn't really I wasn't really into Beastie Boys so much. I was actually going to New York one time. Um I somehow ended up upstate on I was touring and I got dropped off, I don't know where, but this couple, this really nice couple drove me to the city. I was going to interview Karen Finley, um the performance artist. She's a big like one of the only like celebrities I've ever met who I absolutely had a nervous breakdown in front of and was just like, I can't believe I'm meeting you. Um, very embarrassing. Uh, but I was going to interview her in New York and this couple, we got really stoned. I don't smoke pot anymore, but at the time um, I smoked weed with these this couple that I don't even know why I was there. And they drove me to New York in their sob. It was a black sob. And I was sitting in the back and I was high as fuck and they put on Paul's Boutique. And I was like, what is this? And I just like was so into it and was like, wow, you know, what a great record. And so that was like the only thing I really knew that much about them besides Fight for the Right to Party, um, which I'd seen on MTV with my mom in the 80s. And we were like, oh, look at those frat guys, you know, like. Totally frat guy ish. It just it just didn't really register. I was like, oh, whatever, you know. But and early uh, on, a lot of misogyny too. Tied oh, to- yeah, definitely. And that that was one of the things that when we first started dating, it was like, you know, how many jokes could we possibly have about starting a TV show called The Rapper and the Feminist? Like, it it was kind of nonstop. Like, because we for a long time, like you know, we weren't public about our relationship, and. You know, it wasn't, I guess I was kind of scared of, you know, punk rock had, in the 90s, there was this sort of an independent music, I should say, like independent meaning not on a major label. Um, there was this real divide of like, you're either on one side or the other, the major label side or the independent label side or the, you know, underground culture punk side or you're on a major label and you're, you know, 
you have a publicist and you're doing interviews and stuff like that, or you're in a punk band and you're, you know, you, you do fanzine interviews or you make your own fanzines and you make your own artwork. And it was really like this stark kind of, it started to be very like purist and, um, and Nirvana actually getting back to them really kind of challenged that because they wrote amazing songs and they wanted people to hear them. And I have no problem with that. And some people did. And some people were like, they're not a part of our scene anymore, you know, whatever. And I thought that was so incredibly cruel and ignorant. And like, so what if they don't want to play $5 shows for the rest of their lives and, you know, be sleeping on couches? Like, they deserve to have their own sound people and tour managers and, you know, be able to put out the best possible work that they can. I never had any problem with it. But then that, you know, thing that kind of hit them when they signed to Geffen, when I started dating Adam, I felt like, oh God, am I going to get that, that same kind of shit? You know, because not only did he put out these super sexist records in the 80s, but, you know, he had a dick on stage, like they had a blow up dick. It's actually, it's not a blow up dick. It's a hydraulic. It's a hydraulic dick. Hydraulic dick. Which... When he corrected me, I was like, you're honestly correcting me about what kind of dick it was? Because I was like, you had a blow up dick on stage, dude. This and he's the, like, this is, the, this is the line of the day. <laughs> it's not a blow up. It's not a blow up dick, Kathleen. It's a hydraulic dick. <laughs> Sorry, I can't restrain. It's so funny. <laughs> I was like, okay, I, we'll just leave this there. I don't know. You know I what I mean? Like, I was like, this. I was like, I was like, I got to go. But no. It was all in good fun, all in good fun. But, you know, he's super embarrassed about that stuff. And he's, like, publicly apologized for it. And, like, to me, it's so awesome that a guy who was, like, king of the dudes, like, literally king of the dudes in the 90s, could get up on stage and talk about the rapes of Woodstock in front of millions of people was, like... I can't tell you how many women have said they they cried when they saw that. They're like, somebody somebody heard us, somebody saw us. Um, and MTV, of course, edited it out um, for the subsequent showing. So you have to go on the internet to see Gross. it. Um, but I was there when he did it, and it was terrifying. Nobody was like, good job. People were like, oh, my God. Like, you know, who farted? That was horrible. Like, we ran out of there. It felt like some people were going to like start screaming at us. We were like, we better go. It was like, you can't, we didn't go back to our seats. Like he just got a huge award. I don't even know if he got it. Like we just ran out, you know, and got on the subway and went home. But yeah, I mean, we met and we fell in love and I was like, oh, you can't really pick who you fall in love with, you know? And he's so funny. Like, and you can tell from the, the, the records that he's like got a really good sense of humor. And I just think that's, the sexy, I mean, besides that he's super cute, like sexiest, sexiest quality in any human being is a good sense of humor. And, you know, nowadays that has been, you know, going through COVID together, going through illness together, um, adopting a child together, like all the different things that we've been through, um, deaths, lawsuits, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And it's like, you know, we, he still just makes me laugh. Like when I feel at my lowest, lowest point, he'll, <laughs> he'll be like, meh, 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 meh. <laughs> like just do something so stupid and I'll just find myself laughing. And he really has a way of, um, making me remember that all the shitty stuff doesn't compare to the joy you can feel in the present moment. Um, and that doesn't mean my eyes are off of the genocide in Gaza. That doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to all of the rights that are being rolled back in the United States. But it does mean that I have, you know, I feel like part of the way to honor so much pain that so many are, people are in is to enjoy as many moments as I possibly have on this earth, you know, and then to use the privilege that I do have to make things better when I can, you know? But yeah, he's, he's great. <laughs> I mean, it's, he sounds so much like the way I experience you. It, you're, even though like you, you know, Bikini Kill is kind of a, is a legendary band, La Tigra too, in its own way. 
you're super chill and down to earth and you just keep it real. I mean, it's kind of like what I noticed about you when I met you and you're exactly the same now. You're you're not here for fame or status or like I, it doesn't feel like it or being some sort of icon. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, I do want to sell my book because like I worked on it really hard. So you know what I mean? And like I like ripped my hair out <laughs> over that thing. I actually did lose a ton of hair. Um, when oh. I was writing it and I was like, oh, it's menopause. And then my doctor was like, what happened to you three months ago? And I was like, oh, I was finishing my book. I was in the last few weeks of finishing my book and it was hell. And she was like, your hair will probably grow back. And it has, it started to grow back. So good. It's, ex it's exhausting and overwhelming and intimidating to write these books and your book yeah. right here is, is dope. And it, and, and your book reads sort of like the way, really like who you are. And how you describe your your husband as well, and uh, you know, and I, I, and I think that's something super, super um, important. And so I want to, I just, I want to kind of end by, I, I love combining questions, so I'll make this, I'll, I'll kind of tell you the two questions and lead you. First, I want to ask you um, about kind of your hope and your dreams and your aspirations for like activist activism for music and punk culture for feminism like where are we at on these issues i mean i you just alluded to a horrific disgusting shameful u.s backed full on genocide in gaza and so like it feels like a difficult time <laughs> to put it mildly you know when we have like the person kind of backing this genocide or we have like a neo-nazi feels like who would definitely be pro supportive of this genocide. So I want to ask you about that both on the personal and on the wider level. And then I'm going to, and then I'll ask you a final question. So, I mean, on a personal level, obviously like, you know, every day is a struggle. You know, you walk through the kitchen and think about people losing their entire families, you know, people wishing maybe they weren't, they didn't survive because their whole family is gone. And it's, I will literally get upset, but it's just like, it, it definitely is hard to be like doing press and, um, you know, selling t-shirts for my t-shirt company and doing stuff on social media because it's like very cognizant. And that's not the only genocide going on. Like, that's the thing is we always have stuff that's going on in the Congo that's going on, you know, everywhere that if it's not white people, we just, you know, we the U.S. Care. doesn't give a shit. Look and, at Haiti right now. And yeah. how this is all connected to the U.S., Neo-imperialism. You know? Yeah. And, you know, I can sign petitions. I can say things on the internet. I can do what I, I can do. Um, but I also really believe in the power of art. And I really believe that while artists don't change legislation or decide who the president is and we can't be the ones to create a third-party system or a four-party system or a socialist system, which is what I is my dream, we can create sort of the the soil that that grows in. You know what I mean? Like I've met people from all over the world who have been affected by by punk feminism and who have gone into their respective, you included, who have gone into their respective careers um, with a punk attitude, with the attitude of, 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 I can change things. And even though I'm only one person, I can within a community be stronger. And how we, so many of us have realized like, it's not about American individualism or being lost in a group. We are stronger as individuals when we are in community and when we're connected to each other. And those things give me total hope and make me feel like, you know, fans and punks today are creating the soil for change and young people in general are just like, they are not putting up with shit anymore. You know what I mean? Like the kid who stands up totally and says, agree. totally agree. Kids who stand up to their teachers. And I have a, a friend of mine who just graduated from high school who was in college and was like, you know, I told my teacher my pronoun and they didn't listen. And, and having parents that go to the teacher and say, you can't do that. And having kids who know that that's wrong that they don't have to take it. Sometimes they do, they take it and then, but they can talk to people about it now. Whereas before we didn't have language for a lot of this stuff. And I definitely didn't have 
the, the knowledge that things that were happening around me were wrong or happening to me were wrong. And some of the things I was doing was wrong. Um, and right now it's like, you know, things like, you know, Afropunk that was started by James Spooner and, and his partner has now kind of blossomed into, and, and so many other people, you know, Sister Riot from, from New York and a lot of different groups have, have created this black and brown punk scene that's just exploding like and they're having the shows all over even and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, people who were involved in punk in the eighties and nineties are, you know, leading the way and young people are leading the way. And like J James Spooner just edited this book called black punk now. And, um, it's, you know, highlighting all of these, these bands today that are coming out and that are challenging things that, you know, aren't from my lived experience at all. And I'm so thrilled to get to be a part and get to be in some of the audiences. And I just see that that's, that's the future of punk for me is that people of color are going to lead the way. And, um, and it's not my stage anymore. Sure. I still play, still, I play, I still play shows and I really, really love it. But, um, yeah, the stuff that I, that I'm looking towards, um, is way less homogenized than it, it was before. Yeah, because punk's a spirit, right? And like once we've caught that spirit, like well, it will it will I mean I at least in my case it will be with me forever. I might have like my hair looking like this or like this or whatever, but <laughs> the punk will the punk punk will never leave me. Never. Never. You know, and you know it. Like it's it's sort of like you're a punk, you're you're a punk, you know? I mean through and I through. mean there's tons of girls who like, you know, are buying their crop tops at the mall right now who on the way home are going to get harassed and yell, fuck you. And like, isn't that girl punk? She is to me. That's the <laughs> spirit know? right there. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, there's, it, it's, it's like rights of spring said, I believe in moments, transparent moments, moments in time when you've got to stake your faith. Oh man. Amen. <laughs> so, so, you know, final, final question for you. So I want, um, I want to you to help us uh, know where how we can find this amazing book Rebel Girl, you know, your your book that's just come out. Um how can we I mean I I know many of our listeners will easily find Bikini Kill and and La Tigra and other things you're up to, but how can people like follow you, keep up with you or whatever you want us to keep up with, you know that is tied yeah. to you. There's a www.kathleenhanna.com and it has like all of the book tour information and how to buy the book through your local indie bookstore. I totally encourage people to in real life, go to their bookstore and support their local bookstore. I have a company called Tease for Togo and the, the profits generated. The, the whole reason it started is because I'm the ambassador for a nonprofit called Peace Sisters and that provides um, education and educational support for women living in Togo, West Africa, for young girls and for women. Um, we've built a computer lab. We have tutors now. We've gotten people ID cards, which is important because girls can't continue their education into college if they don't have these ID cards. They're incredibly hard to get. Um, many girls don't have a birth certificate. We provide solar light so people can study. It's an amazing program, and it was started by a Togolese women, woman who moved to Pasadena named Tina Campor, and I'm honored to be their ambassador. And I started a t-shirt company to support their work, and it's called Tease for Togo. And um, got a lot of punk greats. Uh, we have like one of a, sh a shirt of Guy and Brendan from Fugazi, which is very rare because they don't usually let their image be used for anything. Um, I have an ad rock shirt. I have shirts of me. Cool. I have shirts of a lot of different comedians that I love. John Waters uh, allowed us to do a sweatshirt and all of it's licensed. Like we never just take an image of somebody and put it out. Like this is all a community effort where like I went to Chuck D, one of my idols and said, Chuck, can I do this shirt? Um, and he was like, oh. gave me his blessing. You know, we just did a limited edition line with uh, Queen Latifah, Run DMC and... Um, that's amazing. And salt and pepper. And we did a Beastie Boys um, thing when they named a street. And, you know, we're just, it's been really gratifying to be able to help, you know, women live out their dreams and have options. Like that's something near and dear to my heart is like, you know, even my mom who was in a first world country who was like, you know, 
in many ways very, very privileged, was really tied to my dad economically and had to give up a lot of her dreams in order to have, have kids. And, um, you know, she was a nurse her, her whole life and she worked a full, you know, 40 hour week, like many people do, um, and raised kids and took care of my dad. And, but she was stuck in a relationship she couldn't get out of because of economics and she wasn't able to go to college. And, um, I just really loved the idea that, you know, every time we sell a shirt, we're helping women go through primary school, high school and college. And I just, I love the idea of being a part of giving another women, woman options because I hate thinking of anybody stuck in a place where they don't have options. Cause these are the people who are going to write the plays and the songs that are going to influence the changing of the world and create that ground I was talking about where, you know, the new stuff can grow. And I want to see the art. I want to read the plays they write. I want to, you know, benefit from the discoveries they make. I mean, really, really inspiring more than anything. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It's, it's, it's really like, there's, there's just so much soul and so much energy and spirit to you and appreciate you very much. Oh, you're sweet Thank you for joining us. The Utopias podcast with Professor Ramesh Srinivasan is produced and edited by me, Phoebe Browse. You can access episodes on all streaming platforms. And if you have questions or comments, please email podcastutopias at gmail.com. That's podcastutopias at gmail.com. See you all next time.